Hello, it's Scott Manley here. One of the biggest pieces of news this week, and in fact possibly this year, has been the National Ignition Facility achieving ignition. Because for 10 years, they have been the National Facility. That middle name has been undeserved. But no, now they believe they have uh, demonstrated the ability to get more energy out of a pellet of fusion fuel than they use to compress it down. So this is a big deal because if you're interested in clean power that doesn't use, you know, dead dinosaurs and dead trees from the ground, fusion is one of those options, which is basically the same thing as powers the sun. So the numbers as they stand are that they put in something like two megajoules of laser energy into this tiny capsule. And once it got hot and compressed enough, it initiated fusion and it burned and released three megajoules of energy. So that's like a 50% terms of gain. To put it another way, right? A, one of those like Twinkie Hostess Cakes things, that's like a 500 megajoules, or sorry, 500 uh, kilojoules. So this is like going from four Twinkies to six Twinkies, right? If you know Ghostbusters, you know that reference. Anyway, um, this is basically at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, right? They have the National Ignition Facility there. The Livermore is just like uh, not that far from me. I literally flew over there the other night and I have a cool video about it. What they do there is they do research on uh, inertial confinement fusion. That is basically where they have the biggest laser in the world that covers three football fields. And they split this laser into 192 beams and they fire at them from all directions onto a tiny capsule of fuel and collapse it down, heat it up. And when it reaches the correct pressures and temperatures, it releases energy. And they have been working towards getting more energy out than they put in for a very long time. Now, there is a caveat here. Those lasers are only about 1% efficient. The National Ignition Facility was designed sort of more or less in the 90s uh, to, and it was sold to Congress as a way to do weapons research, as well as doing basic science on the kind of high temperature, high density states of matter. So, it, so you know, there's the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty that basically stops the US, Russia, China from actually detonating nuclear weapons to develop new ones. The US has a ton of money and it built this ginormous laser so they can recreate the conditions inside thermonuclear weapons. And potentially, if they come up with a way of generating nuclear explosions without actually detonating nuclear weapons, that could be a power source. But when they built it, they used the lasers, which were well understood at the time. And they are like 1% efficient. They put in a lot of energy. They actually start with a single beam that gets split into all these different parts. They go through a series of amplifiers, which are fed by flash bulbs that are all rigged up to huge capacitor banks. And then these beams go through frequency multipliers that take them from the infrared lasers up through green and to ultraviolet and then shoot them into the chamber from many angles and they hit this little uh, target. So the target is called a holgram. It's actually a little gold cylinder and it's about five millimeters, you know, quarter of an inch in diameter. And in the middle, there's a two millimeter pellet containing fusion fuel. That's about one tenth of an inch. And wh what happens is they're not actually shooting that little pellet in the middle. They're actually shooting the walls. So there's, if you imagine there's a window in the top, they shoot the lasers and hit the insides. And these sides basically heat up and turn to plasma and emit huge amounts of x-rays. And these x-rays get directed inwards. And the pressure, the photon pressure from these x-rays is apparently sufficient to start compressing this. They generate a, you know, heating on the surface and that blows off and that generates even more pressure. If the fusion fuel they use has a density which is less than that of water, but at peak implosion, they reach pressures of a thousand times that of water. So this is a serious implosion. The temperatures are tens of millions of uh, Celsius. This is way hotter and denser than the core of the sun because it's only able to hold on to this high density, high pressure, high temperature state for a vanishingly small amount of time. 
the amount of time that this reaction occurred over was one tenth of a nanosecond. That is less time than your computer takes to operate on one single instruction. You know, computers today, like they're like three, four gigahertz. This is this would be like one ten, 10 gigahertz. They would have to be to execute one instruction in the time that this thing was ignited and burning with this raging inferno. Like, if you do the math, because it released 300 megajoules, oh, sorry, three megajoules of energy, but it did it over such a radically short time, this thing was actually producing more wattage than the entire power grid of the US, albeit for a vanishingly small time. Now, as I said, this is actually way denser than the core of the sun. The sun, however, is this massive thing held together by gravity, and it has billions of years to do fusion. The core of the sun is actually fusing together hydrogen, and the thing is hydrogen is really lousy as a fusion fuel because what happens is you get two hydrogen nuclei, two protons, they come together, they stick together as two protons, and then they're like, I really don't like this, and they fall apart. To make fusion in the core of the sun work, you have to get the two protons together. And before they realize that they really don't belong together, one of them has to decay into a neutron. One of them basically has to fly close enough to an electron to absorb that. And then they release energy. And then you've got deuterium. And then very quickly, they go from deuterium up through to helium. But that first step to go from the two protons into deuterium takes a very long time. Now, in nuclear reactors, sorry, in these, uh, you know, implosion tests for fusion fuel on Earth, we use deuterium and tritium because they have the lowest temperature and pressure requirements. This is something called the Lawson criteria. So the Lawson criteria, uh, you basically take the sort of temperature, the pressures and time, and you put these together in an equation. And if they're big enough, then you get energy. If they're too small, then you're not able to. So if you don't, if you hold them together at high enough temperatures and pressures, but not for long enough, you just don't produce enough energy to justify. If you, if you hold them together for a longer time, you can use lower pressures and temperatures. If you are very low temperatures, you might need until beyond the edge of the universe for fusion to actually happen. So yeah, at NIF, they're producing the highest temperatures and densities on the planet. And this is not a trivial thing to do. They've had the energy in their laser beams for a long time, but they've been working on tuning the like the timing of the pulse so that it comes in and delivers the energy uh, correctly. They've been working with on the geometry of the capsule. You know, if there is anything in the pellet which is slightly the wrong shape, then as they squeeze it down, those errors get amplified. As you squeeze something down, you get something called uh, Rayleigh-Taylor instability. And that's basically, if you imagine, if you have a flat layers of liquid and you have like a heavier liquid on top of a lighter liquid, what happens is you get a depression forming and that turns into a spout. And when you're squeezing something down like this, you get the same kind of instability occurring. And that will actually ruin, that will basically ruin your implosion capability. So you want to keep things as perfectly spherical as possible. The On the panel, they specifically talk about how the spheres are like two millimeters across the fuel pellets and errors or imperfections of the size of a bacteria are enough to ruin their day and basically make the thing not work uh, reliably. Now, one of the interesting things about NIF is they actually take four of the lasers and send them through a slightly different route through these like x-ray imaging system. So they use the laser to generate x-rays and they arrive slightly different times to generate these x-ray pulses. And so they can actually take x-rays of the collapsing particle, or the collapsing pellet, and produce really interesting, I guess really fascinating movies that tell them exactly what is going on on nanosecond, sub-nanosecond scales. Yeah, and this isn't the only diagnostics they have. One of the other things they'll do is they put materials next to it which uh, will absorb neutrons and create neutron-activated metals which will emit gamma radiation so that they can actually figure out how many neutrons were admitted. And so they are pretty confident that they generated 
more than three megajoules, I'm sure they will come out with more details over time because it's a relatively recent occurrence. Now, this is a you know, pretty cool achievement, but it's a long way from being a viable power solution in uh, the near future. Uh, like, sure, a year ago, they generated 1.3 megajoules and they were having, you know, saying that was a big deal. Now it's three megajoules. So, you know, if they can do six next year and then 12 the year after that, then, you know, we'll be sorted by the end of the decade, right? Probably not, right? That's probably not going to happen. Although one of the important things to realize is the fact that they have achieved ignition where the burning of the fuel is helping to feed the reaction. It does mean that they have sort of reached this non-linear position where they will get more energy out more easily if they now that they've solved a lot of these problems. But turning this into something that can actually generate energy, that's not going to happen with this design. For a start, the fuel pellets are simply too small to ever accommodate what has, uh, you know, the, the laser system they have. So this is a small but significant step towards fusion power. And many of you want to know, does this solve our problems? How close are we as a human race to clean, controllable nuclear fusion? And my answer is 96 million miles or 150 million kilometers. The sun is right there. Gravitational confinement works very well. If you want to get fusion power on the Earth, in a controllable environment where you can extract power, you need to somehow build a box that can contain the sun. So inertial confinement fusion is one strategy. Again, all those lasers shooting and squeezing things down. Um, at, at the National Ignition Facility, they have the problem that they're using these very inefficient lasers. They could definitely make those lasers more efficient. I think if they scaled up the power and scaled up the size of the pellets, they could possibly reach some sweet spot where they're producing more power from this than they're putting in from the lasers. Then the next problem is how do you take that power and convert it into uh, electricity? And unfortunately, I don't really have any good ideas because most of the energy comes out as neutrons. You can't really capture those. What you do actually is you have materials around your chamber that will absorb the neutrons and generate more tritium so you can feed it back into the reaction. The, it's very important that you get these source fuels. Deuterium is relatively common in seawater, but tritium is radioactive and it is very rare. Uh, a lot of the world's supply of tritium actually comes from Canadian nuclear reactors. They have heavy water as a coolant and the heavy water, deuterium, will absorb neutrons and very rarely and they can take that tritium out and then sell it. And it's staggeringly expensive stuff. And when it decays by a via radioactivity, it also produces helium-3, which is also very expensive. Uh, so anyway, uh, yeah, the best I can come up with is, yeah, you know, just heat, use the heat to heat water and then get electricity out of that. So then you need several orders more magnitude to actually generate a stable, uh, you know, a, a viable fusion reaction power station. Now, of course, inertial confinement fusion isn't the only option here. There's a lot of research going into magnetic confinement fusion. That's where you basically keep your uh, hydrogen as a plasma and you heat it up using magnetic fields and electrostatic coils. There's various devices. There are stellarators, tokamaks, spheromaks. The biggest thing being built right now is the ITER tokamak and you know, maybe they will be able to achieve some sort of fusion. So they're not doing like this pulse system. They are going to have a sustained thing, which will probably have lower temperatures and definitely lower pressures. But because they're able to sustain it for longer, that's how they're going to get their loss in criteria. There's also a company called General Fusion. And while well, their design has a, a rotating metal, liquid metal vortex, and they have like these plasma injectors at the top. And what they do is at the right moment, they inject a whole bunch of like superheated plasma with deuterium and tritium. And these pistons then squeeze this vortex of liquid metal together and it slams hard. And the inertia of this slam increases the pressure, increases the temperature, and they get a flash of fusion. And the nice thing is that the heat that comes out is absorbed by this liquid metal. So it pretty much covers the whole getting energy out 
system quite well. You know, there's actually lots of ways to generate fusion using small devices. In fact, they had demonstrated nuclear fusion before they had demonstrated nuclear fission because you can basically take deuterium atoms in a, you know, accelerate them as ions and slam them into a target and generate you know, helium. There are neutron generators used for examining interiors by zapping, you know, accelerating deuterium into a target. Um, people build like fusers, which you again use electrostatic fields, but none of these things get more energy out than they put in. They're more interested in just seeing the neutrons flying around. There's another cool way apparently that's been demonstrated where you can hit uh, bubbles bubbling through like a liquid with a, you know, um, deuterium and tritium. And if you hit them with a shock wave that's hard enough, as the bubble collapses, it can pinch down enough to generate tiny amounts of fusion. This has been demonstrated. It's really cool. But look, this isn't going to solve the world's energy problems now. Uh, it's going to be a very long road still. But I, what I am excited by is the fact that the Department of Energy basically stepped up and they wanted to own this and say that they are actually committed to doing more research in this direction because it would be amazing for the world if we can unlock this and find a nuclear future which doesn't involve huge amounts of fissile materials and lots of fissile byproducts. It's a future I want to live in. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.